for Arkansas Week provided by the Arkansas Democrat Gazette, the Arkansas Times, and KUAR FM 89. Hello again, everyone, and thanks very much for being with us. Education, job training, the General Assembly. With the legislature now sitting, we'll speak in a moment with a woman who's chairing the Upper Chamber's Education Committee about her sense of the session that has just begun. But first, perhaps you've heard Arkansas has a new governor, the first woman to hold the job, and she takes it 26 years after her father took it, 16 years after he left it. In her two inaugural speeches last Tuesday, Sarah Huckabee Sanders outlined in somewhat greater detail the agenda that she will put before the legislature. That agenda, that legislature, both solidly conservative. The House has its first third-term speaker. The Senate, meantime, has a new president pro tem, the first from Cave Springs. Senator Bart Hester joins us now. Mr. President, thanks very much for coming in. Hey, thanks for having me today. You have, uh, along with the speaker, have had a, uh, an opportunity to spend a little one-on-one -on -one or two-on-one -on -one time with our new governor. Give us your sense of where she is headed. I'll tell you, I, I have had some time with uh, Governor Sanders, and I'll tell you, she's confident, she's prepared, and she's headed to do exactly what she spent the last year or two telling the people of Arkansas where she was headed, education reform, criminal justice reform and tax reform. Well, in terms of education, what, what can you share with us that she may have shared with you? Okay. Well, I, I will tell you, you know, the legislature has a significant part in that role, right? We have to believe where we're going and, and, and it's mostly based on parental empowerment and everything focused on the student. And um, so anything that we feel like we're putting in this bill, it's gonna be student driven, not, uh, not some institution driven. Well. Parental empowerment strikes fear in the hearts of a great many in the education establishment. You know that. Uh, yeah. And, you know, as, as, as destructive or corrosive on the traditional paradigm of public education in Arkansas or anywhere. Well, that's right. Uh, and I think that's an unfounded <coughs> fear. From You can look all at all parts of the country where that happens. Really what we know is competi competition uh, ra raises everyone. And uh, at the end of the day, we know that if parents have the right to choose, education is going to get better for kids in Arkansas. I have four kids, um, but maybe public school is best for one, private school is best for one, and homeschool is best for another. And it shouldn't be based on where I live or my parents' income if I have choices or not in education. Well, the governor, <coughs> excuse me, has seemed to indicate and fairly strongly that parochial schools could be in the mix as well. And that's likely to trigger some opposition on, on First Amendment grounds. Uh, is the General Assembly prepared to go along with her in that or to that extent? Oh, I think we are absolutely prepared to go along with that. Uh, we want uh, options regardless of what they are. Uh, but look, if I think there also has to be accountability. If we're going to help a family or send some tax dollars with a family to homeschool in some way or to go to a private school in some way, I think that those kids should also be held to some standards with testing. And so uh, nothing is free. Uh, like I said, anything is gonna come with what is focused on the student. If choice is good, then we're gonna make sure that that student is learning, and which means they're gonna have to be tested or some, some level of measuring their has success. That, I'm sorry, go ahead. No, just some level of measuring their success. Okay, has that been, have you, is that part of the administration's plan as you understand it? The, the accountability, the testing? The, the, the accountability and, and, and some sort of measurables Right, whether that's testing or a different one. I had a meeting with uh, uh, the new Secretary Jacob Oliva in my office this morning with about a dozen senators, bipartisan. And I think when we left that meeting, even if you didn't agree with everything he said, uh, members were very confident in how competent he was, how prepared he was, and that he is going to uh, have uh, accountability and measurables for students. In, in terms of the, the less populated portions of the state, particularly in the Delta, uh, some portions of the Delta, South Arkansas, those areas that are losing population. Mm -hmm. The options for, say, charters or for other forms of formal education would seem to be uh, something of a stretch. Well, I will say... I mean, how, do, how, do you, how do you plan to implement that, or how would that be? Well, we need great high-performing teachers, and I will tell you, uh, what we know is we have some great high-performing teachers in those schools. We need more of them. And uh, I will tell you from, from the governor's mouth to mine, we need to pay them. We need to pay them more than we've been talking about paying them. Uh, we've, there's, there's been uh, stuff in the news for the past year about what we need to pay teachers. 
I would say it wouldn't surprise me if Governor Sanders doesn't want to do more than that. Uh, she is she is committed to our teachers because she knows great teachers is going to produce uh, successful kids. Pre-K. Uh, yes, so that's that's part of the talking point. We understand that we've got to have not just the talking point, but the bill. We've got to we've got to start investing in our students uh, before they get to kindergarten because we've got to teach them to read by third grade so we, they can read to learn after third grade. Well, at the end of this session, will it be possible? Well, I mean, will there be pre-K at least the the availability of pre-K from Miller to Clay? <laughs> um, I hope so, uh, but I don't know exactly how that's going to go. It's going to be such a big bill that does so much change in Arkansas, it's going to take time. And whether so much of that can be done day one or day 300, I don't know. But, w but we're, we're going to pass a bill that's going to be uh, implemented in stages is how I expect. We just saw in Iowa that uh, the new governor of Iowa laid out a plan yesterday where she said it would be implemented by 2026. I don't know that we're going to do 2026 or 2024 or 2027, but it's kind of the same strategy. You can't do it all overnight. It'll be an implemented process. Have you or uh, others in the administration uh, had a chance to speak with, uh, say, the School Administrators Association, particularly those from rural areas? Well, I just heard from uh, new uh, Secretary Jacob Oliva this morning that he met with uh, uh, many or most, maybe it was at a meeting of our superintendents uh, yesterday, and he said uh, the meeting he thought went well. He was very clear and direct as he's going to be, and he said he's going to desperately seek their feedback, uh, but he's also going to be looking for measurables and accountability. He said Governor Sanders says she's going to be the education uh, governor. For her to be able to do that, he has to do his job, and the superintendents have to do theirs. While we are still on the subject of education, her executive orders, day one, regarding uh, critical race theory or other, what some consider socially divisive concepts, mm -hmm. uh, are we going to get bogged down in that sort of social agenda in this session? Oh, no, we're not going to get bogged down, and I think it's because there's just uh, massive support for the things that we're going to do. I think the people of Arkansas elected Governor Sanders with a basic, almost a supermajority, but they did that, uh, and she's always very clear about the things that she was going to do. We're not looking to, uh, we want our kids to learn to read and write, do math, and understand science and history. We don't want them focused on these, these other issues that, uh, you know, the people of Arkansas don't want their students focused on when they're at school. Were they even exposed to it, though, before now? Well, we're, we know they're not anymore, right? <laughs> uh, so, at, at a bit. Well, the question, I guess, Senator, is mm -hmm. that are we addressing a problem that simply doesn't exist? Well, it is a problem. Even, uh, look, in every school district, you can find a teacher doing something you disagree with, right? So, at the end of the day, this just clarifies it. I mean, I, I go to, I live in an area where Bentonville School District, Rogers School District, I have parents reach out to me routinely, said this was just taught to my student. Now you can't, uh, you can't condemn an entire school district because one teacher is doing something you disagree with. But yes, those things are happening. It's not routine, but it is happening. And Governor Sanders was just assuring parents that when your kids go to our schools, they're going to learn reading, writing, and arithmetic. Well, uh, along that line there, to follow up, if I may, when they contact you about these things, or being mm -hmm. what, th what are these things? What do they complain about? Well, I don't want to talk specifically about it, but I, you know, um, I can go back and look through some text and emails that I have, but look, they're, they are concerned that they are teaching our kids different critical race theory, right? I, I, can, I have videos of a teacher in Northwest Arkansas doing that. And at the end of the day, that's not something parents want, but also I don't want to focus on the one teacher when there's a thousand that are in there doing the right thing. That's why I haven't made a big fuss about it. I wasn't on the news talking about it, but to, you can't say it's not happening when it is happening. Would, would, would you share those videos with an audience? Well, I don't think I want to share them with an audience, but I may, I may show them with you. Again, I'm not looking to disparage an entire school district based on what one person's doing. Talking about phasing in things, as with, with pre-K Senator, uh, it seems pretty obvious he's going to have to phase in tax reduction, income tax reduction. Mm -hmm. At what pace? Can you share anything with us? Well, uh, we've got... Our first two priorities are education reform and then criminal justice reform. When we understand what those costs are, then we will move to income tax reform. The reason those two are our number one focus is because we are focused on the number one resource of Arkansas, our children. We're going to educate them and we're going to make sure they're safe. Once we've done that, once we know that violent repeat offenders aren't walking our streets, uh, that we've got plenty of beds for them, once we know our schools are going well, then we're going to talk about income taxes. We're going to do income taxes. We're going to cut income taxes in Arkansas, but that discussion will come in third uh, after the first two. Well, let's stay with criminal justice then since you uh, brought that up. Uh, is it reform 
Is, is reform the right word when basically what we're talking about is it not just adding more bits? Building more prisons? No, absolutely not. No. There is true reform coming. We want to talk about truth and sentencing in Arkansas. <coughs> when someone opens their newspaper or opens their tablet in the morning and they see that some guy has brutalized a child and they got 50 years, we say, okay, that seems maybe it's even not enough for most of us. But if we if we told him he's only doing a sixth of the 50 years, uh, that wouldn't be acceptable to the people of Arkansas. When they hear when they see 50, they assume 50, not one sixth. So we're gonna we're gonna change that. When it says 50, it ought to say it ought to mean 50. Well, yeah, but is that true reform, though? I mean, it, it, just adding time or to making them serve longer sentences. Mm -hmm. The bottom line on that still remains incarceration. Doesn't That's right. No, it does remain incar incarceration. But you know what we also understand? When we put people in prison, most of them, and we agree after they serve their uh, commitment to society, that they're going to come back out. And we want to be productive citizens. So if we want that, then we've got we've to invest some dollars uh, in, in educating them and having them prepared when they come out, of, uh, come out of prison to work back in society. So that is something that's a true reform. We're doing it pretty good right now. We want to do much better uh, to work on recidivism. We want when they come out of prison that, for them to have options. Okay. Uh, on to taxes now, if we, if we may. At what speed are we going to see reduction? Is there any consensus at all among the legislative leadership and the executive? Uh, there is consensus that we're going to do it and we're going to do it this <laughs> session. Uh, there is no other consensus uh, as of this time. I mean, I've saw some bills get filed, but I can tell you I've talked with House leadership, Senate leadership. We really are moving that, that, that argument will be after uh, prisons and after schools. Well, it, but it's coming. It is absolutely coming. I, uh, without some meltdown in the overall economy, we're going to cut taxes again for the people of Arkansas this session. Well, is there how much concern is there on your part that a, if not necessarily a meltdown, but a sudden reversal? Uh, we're prepared for that in Arkansas. You know, we like I said, we have almost three billion dollars in set asides and surplus money right now. If if there's a change, we're prepared for it. Uh, but what we'll do when we do cut taxes, we're going to do it in a responsible manner, like we've been doing, maybe with some phase ins. Um, not certain that's what we're going to do. We could have them effective day one, but it will depend in a hundred days how our economy's looking. Well, and, and what's your sense of that right now? I sense as things are going strong. I, I mean, I, I, I read yesterday the stock market was roaring because we believe the uh, uh, inflation numbers are going to look better today. I haven't heard how that went. Well, they did were better, in fact. So, uh, if, so. hey, so then, then we're going to be continue to be confident. All right. Uh, is there a timetable at all? I'm, I'm going to nudge mm -hmm. a little bit if I may. A timetable at all? Any kind of consensus about? I've heard some of your members say, you know, this fast and this much, and other members say, wait, let's take it more slowly. On the income tax? Yeah, yes. On yeah. The um, well, look, I, I don't think we're going to take up income <clears throat> tax till the end of March, 1st of April. Uh, and that's number one, because we don't know what our state's budget actually is going to be on the revenues from the time before till about April 15th. Uh, so we're going to have a, a, a plan for it by then. But once we know the actual revenues, whether we're 200 million up or 500 million up at that time, or, or we're flat, so we're really not going to get real serious about that till the end of uh, till the end of March. Any 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 appetite at all in your conference, or for that matter, in the House conference, if you have a good sense of mm -hmm. it, to slow down and take an even more gradual approach than what the administration or what some in the General Assembly would want, and to take some of that money, that three billion that you're talking about, and put it into say higher education or public school. Yeah, I don't see us putting that money into higher education at this time, but it may be that we choose to put more into our public schools. Uh, what we do know is our public schools, uh, they do have a lot of money right now, but, not a, uh, but they're getting a lot of money compared to the results we have. If you look at other states that are funding less and getting better results. Uh, but the reality is, no, as long as we're ha continuing to have budgets of two and three and four hundred million dollars in surplus, we need to be cutting uh, what we're charging people in taxes. It's not our job to overtax people and just have all this money. Uh, as long as our budgets continue to have huge surpluses, we need to continue to aggressively cut taxes. And finally, this senator, you know how to find Fayetteville. Baseball season starts in about <laughs> what five weeks, maybe maybe a month. Five. That's weeks. That's right, real soon. All right, <clears throat> what is the Senate President Pro Tem's former catcher? What's the, what's your prediction? Uh, uh, if I could, I would be buying tickets to the College World Series in oh, Omaha right come now. On. Come on. Uh, at out in Omaha. That's right. If I could buy tickets, I'd be buying them right now. We're going to be there. I plan to be there rooting them on. All right. Senator Bart Hester, President Pro Tem of the Senate, thanks very much for coming in. Thanks come for having soon. me today. Thanks for coming back. Yeah. And we'll be right back.
And we are back. It is an issue in every legislative session, and in the past couple of decades, it has been an especially thorny issue. Public education in Arkansas. How much funding is enough? Are our students making the progress they could be or should be? And are changes or additional changes to the traditional public school paradigm, are those changes in order? Joining us now, Senator Jane English of North Little Rock, chair of her Chambers Education Committee. Senator, as always, thanks for coming in. Thank you very in. much for having me. We are at the edge of a set, well, legislative session now. What <clears throat> education, what's going to happen? What are your priorities as chair? What should be the administration's priorities? Well, I think that we all realize that education is probably the most important thing we can do in the state. It affects absolutely everything else we do, whether you're talking about Medicaid, talking about prisons, no matter what you're talking about, workforce, no matter what you're talking about, education is the first. Well, schools are constitutionally <laughs> mandated. Though. Right, exactly. And uh, I think that we have, um, we all, COVID did, a, did a, a great deal of damage to some of our, our hopes and our expectations. But I think that um, at, at some point we had a 80% goal for all of our students to be reading at grade level. And obviously COVID kind of did, did away with that. Um, we weren't at that before COVID and we certainly aren't at that now. So I think one of the things that is probably going to be a real um, important issue coming up is obviously literacy and trying to figure out a way to make sure that we are taking that kindergarten through third grade to make that the most important place in education. Um, we, if kids can't read, people can't read, they do not really have a future. And I think we have to think about the future for our workforce because every kindergartner that comes in at some point in time is gonna have to go out into the workforce and earn a living. And we need to make sure that we have given all of them the foundational skills to be able to expand their learning as they leave high school and go on to whatever decades of life they're going to have ahead of them. Yeah, you know, I want to come back to that in just a second, if I may, Madam Chair. But uh, first, let's stay with COVID because you, you brought it up. It is possible to quantify the damage that COVID did. Is it in possible? Terms of well, we have, in yes, fact. Yes, yes. I, I think we've all seen that. That it, I, But I think we are fortunate because we didn't close all the schools forever. And, and I think we have maintained, not as like we wouldn't want to have had, but we have not done as badly as, as some other states. I mean, this is a national problem. This is not just an Arkansas problem. It's how do we get everybody up to grade level is a national issue. Not what, just here. Okay. Is there? A, do you have a formula? Is there a formula or a, a program that you would recommend, advocate, no, to I make to make up some of that distance that was lost? No, I. I we've got thousands of programs. Um, I'm not ever sure quite what the accountability is for all of these programs. Spend a lot of money. Every school has lots and lots of programs. But at the end of the day, I'm not sure. I, nobody's been able to show me that those programs all have worked. Otherwise, we probably would be ahead of where we are right now. But, uh, well, but we aren't. So um, I'm not sure. But I, I would hope that we would use this time and effort to really, really focus in on our kindergarten through third grade to make sure that those kids all are reading at grade level by the time they leave the third grade. And, but that doesn't mean that we have to do away and not think about those students that are in the eighth and 10th and 12th grades because they have to have a future and we have to find a way to bring them up to a grade level. Well, sure, uh, but sticking for a second with the K through third grade uh, uh, group, you are talking about a substantial number of youngsters mm -hmm. who come from a home environment in, uh, that puts them at a tremendous disadvantage with their peers from more affluent upbringings, more affluent high. Well, you know, surprisingly, in, the, in, in some of the, on the school report card, which I think is really interesting, and I've spent a lot of time going through that report card, looking at um, uh, report cards across the state um, about the grades, about the, where they were A through F or whatever, um, the composition of their demographics, what their, how many teachers they had, how, what the turnover rate was. And you'd be surprised at some of the places that you actually thought wouldn't do well at all have done very well. 
and places that you thought might do very well didn't do as well at all. So in a school district, you can almost go through all the elementary schools, the middle schools, the high school, and look to see where those grades are. And, and if you have an F student, I mean an F um, elementary school, there's probably not going to be much chance that you're going to have a B or an A middle school or high school. If you have a, a B elementary school, there's a very good chance. And some of it doesn't really make any difference what the, the composition of the population is. And in some of these schools, the demographics, the of demographics that. some of these schools, they, um, the uh, uh, teachers and the administrators have said, this is the population we have to deal with and we're going to make it work. And they have said no excuses and they've made it work. Um, so there are a number of those schools across the state that have done really very well with populations that you would think wouldn't do well at all. You have 134 colleagues right. in, in both chambers, and, and some of them believe that the answer to that dilemma is, to, is parental choice, school choice, I should say. Do you anticipate a, well, there would appear to be a substantial body of opinion that believes we should expand school choice, parental choice in terms of, I think uh, you know, that's, vouchers, what, that's coming, is it not? I or? think that's going to be on the agenda. I have no idea what that looks like. I, I'm not, I've not seen any legislation. I have not been involved in that discussion, so I don't know what that looks like. Well, as a concept, though. As a concept, that's probably out there. Um, you know, we have school choice right now. And right now you have schools that are advertising, come and, come and be part of my school. And, um, and I think that uh, we talk about parental involvement or empowerment, I think is more, more the word. But I think one of the things that's really important too is, is that if parents are involved in their kids, their children's education, more than just at the school board meetings, but also on a day-to-day -day basis. Oh, sure because that really is critically important. It's important for the community to be involved. Uh, well, but, and we were talking just a second though about the, how some students from disadvantaged backgrounds mm -hmm. particularly can excel mm -hmm. or, can. or at least succeed beyond expectations. I think we, we have to assume, we have to say, and I think, have to think that every child can learn, that we have to provide the proper um, and appropriate uh, opportunities and education for them to be able to you know if you don't if you don't test a child um, but one time when they start school and the next time when the school is finished at the end of the semester then how do you know where you need to help them true you but well you're going to have to does that not suggest that some s schools some groups of students anyway are going to, to require to get to where you want them to be, where everybody wants them right. to be. It's going to take some, some extra resources. Yeah, it, it probably will. Mm -hmm. And maybe that's where we ought to be spending a lot of our resources is to make sure that those first four years, kindergarten through third grade, are the most important where all the resources are. And sometimes even I've talked to some superintendents and we have more programs and more money. It's, it's just having that focus on each one of those children. And I've been in schools where those things are happening and where I visited classrooms and students are sounding out words. They're sounding out letters. They're sound, and you know, but they're really just encouraging to me. Uh, it's the way I grew up. It's the way you grew up. And, and it's kind of hard, I think, for us to think there's a different way, or that has been a different way over time. Um, but you grew up with phonics. You grew up learning how to sound out, what, knowing what vowels were. You, you did that A-E-I-O-U for as a little kid. And that's, that's the kind of thing we're, we're trying to get back to. You mentioned a moment ago, Senator, that there are, in fact, uh, schools that are ad, more or less advertising, you know, mm -hmm. come send your kids here. Mm -hmm. will, you know, we're, your kids are welcome here. That strikes fear in the hearts of some superintendents. I'm sure it does. But if, if you look here in the central Arkansas area, in North Little Rock and Jacksonville, everybody's got the sign out that says come in and be part of our school system. And, and so it's sometimes if you say it's um, a matter of um, I like the programs that they have there in that school district or I like the, the whatever, the football team, whatever the case may be. Um, is a reason that some people are making that choices. 
I would love to continue this conversation, Senator, and we will if you promise to come back. I will probably do that. I'll uh, what do you mean, probably? I, I will be glad to do that. All right, good. Now that <laughs> settles that. Senator English, thanks very much thanks for coming very aboard. Much. Thank you. As always, we thank you for joining us. See you next week. Support for Arkansas Week provided by the Arkansas Democrat Gazette, the Arkansas Times, and KUAR FM 89.